This is a great church, and I'm honored to be here as an executive officer because we're going to do some official business, as Pastor Andrew has mentioned, and there's a, a, a very historic transition happening, positive transition that's happening in this congregation because of what God has been doing and how you've been participating in what God wants to do in local churches that often start really small and then they grow and they develop and they become autonomous and sometimes churches get to that autonomous level of general council status and then they go through some tough times and some shifting and and, uh, and, and, and it has to revert back to a supervised situation. And that was this church's situation. And Pastor Andrew and Mary came in and said, God's called us, and with God's help, God's going to help this church get healthy and grow and move forward. And, and today marks, marks an official transition back to general council status that uh, our district leaders, our church health team, have approved. We've seen... The records, we see the manifestation of this being an autonomous, self-governing, self-supporting, self-propagating church. And all it needs is the approval of your membership, and we're going to get that at the end of this service. Because that indicates onward growth, onward momentum, to, to be a force to be reckoned with in this city for Jesus. The devil has an agenda, and he wants to kill, steal, and destroy and he does it in a variety of different ways. And in order to stem that tide of what the enemy is trying to do, especially in these last days, what does God do? God plants local churches on street corners or along highways like here. And he builds these churches and he plants these churches and he helps grow these churches so that they can be a life-saving station for people that are drowning in sin and drowning in Apathy and drowning in depression and drowning in drugs and drowning in alcohol and drowning in all kinds of things that is bringing their life to a sad ending. And God plants a church, sends a pastor, a wife and kids and raises up church leaders and, and you are a life-saving station for this area, Pine City and the region beyond the city limits. And it's exciting to see what God has been doing. The momentum of church growth, I love what you say here, Pastor Andrew, that your church mission statement, does everybody know the church mission statement? If you don't know it, here's what it is. It's very easy to remember. Growth happens here. Say it with me. Growth happens here. The vision of this pastor is to see people grow out of a life without knowing Jesus and to grow into a relationship with Jesus. That all it takes is one single decision by faith to say yes to the Lord and have Him forgive all your sins. And in a moment, in an instant, you're a new creation in Christ. And that's just the beginning of change. That's just the beginning of growth. From the very first day of your faith in Christ to, to the last breath you breathe, if you've been a Christian for 10 years or 20 years or 30 years or 40 years, if you're 80 or 90 or in your hundreds, you're still growing in the Lord. That's God's, goal. That's God's call for all of us, to take the next step. And so that's the vision for every man, woman, boy and girl, old to young, young to old, and everybody in between, every Sunday, the challenge that this pastor feels is, God, give me a word to help people take one more step of growth, one more step towards the perfect image of Jesus, one more step in, in, in manifesting the power of the Holy Spirit that is meant to be activated in our lives. But to not be children being tossed to and fro by every cunning wind of deception, but to keep growing in Christ, and that's what your vision is. This morning, I want to I wanna deliver a message that I just wrote in the last few weeks. I've never preached this message before, but I was thinking about this day and what this means and what this is all about to go from district supervised status to general council status. And to many of you, you don't even know what that means. It just simply means you're growing up. You're, you're 18 years old again and you're being pushed out the door. You're being shoved out of, the, out of the nest and you're about to fly as an autonomous Assemblies of God church. No longer are you on your crutches. No longer are you on a support system other than the support system of the Holy Spirit. And I'm telling you something, 
when God grabs a hold of a congregation who has captured its vision and has joined into the heartbeat of your local pastor that has been called by God to be here, and you tie into that, whew, there's, there's no telling what God can do here. There's no telling what God can do. The church is God's plan A to bring redemption to this planet. How do I know that? Number one, let me give you four points. Number one, the church is born. The church, 2,000 years ago, was born. And that means a couple of things. That the church, like babies, have birthdays. Have days in which they were actually born. Now, I'm going to tell you something that's going to blow your mind. Because as you look at me, you don't even know that I'm 59 years old. I put this special cream on my face and I look so young. <laughs> you can't be nearly 60 years old, Pastor Doug. Well, I am. And I'm going to now blow your mind. My wife and I have been married 38 years this summer. We have four children, three boys who are all married, and they've produced, our sons and their daughter, our daughters-in-law, they've produced nine grandchildren for us. And I know you're saying you're too young to have nine grandchildren. Vicki and I started early. We got married. I was 20. She was 19. Came to North Central Bible College. And I got a job as a youth pastor for Pastor Hale. We're sitting right here. He was my first boss in the ministry. And what a wonderful training I had for two years serving at Anoka Assembly of God. It was fantastic. I might even break out a hymnal, Pastor Larry, and start leading a song service as you taught me how to do that. But I got nine grandchildren, and guess what? After church today, I wish I could stay for lunch, but I can't stay for lunch because I got two grandsons, twin boys, that are having a birthday party this afternoon. Two years old. Two years old. Birthdays. You know, we celebrate our, our children's birthdays and our birthdays, significant days. The church has a birthday. It was born 2,000 or so years ago. And it says in Acts chapter 2, verse 1, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, like the sound of the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated, came to rest upon them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Or we might say they were baptized in the Holy Spirit for the very first time, and they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them, and the church was born. It was birthed. Jesus had come and he had lived a perfect life. He had died a criminal's death. He was crucified, dead and buried. He was raised from the dead. And then he ascended into heaven several days later. And he basically said to the believers, he said, I'm out of here. I'm gone. I'm going back to the Father. And they all said, well, who's going to stay for us? If you're leaving, how are we going to make it? And Jesus had been telling them, I'm gonna, the Father is going to send a gift in fact, when I leave, don't spread out, don't quit, don't go back to fishing, Peter. But go back to Jerusalem and wait. And wait, because something's going to happen. There's going to be a birth. Something has been conceived in the heart of God from the beginning of time, and, it, and that baby is going to be delivered. The church is going to be born, but I need you to be in that upper room, and I need you just to be patient. Can you imagine? Do you know how long they were waiting? The Bible tells us they were sitting there for 10 days. Could you sit in a prayer meeting for 10 days? <laughs> Pastor Andrew calls a special prayer meeting, and we say, well, Pastor Andrew, how long is that prayer meeting going to be? He's gonna, and he doesn't tell you up front. He just, I don't know. He doesn't even know. We're just going to sit, and we're going to wait. And after an hour, you might be ready to leave after... Two hours, you might be ready to leave. It's midnight, you might be ready to leave. And Jesus said, I want, you to, I want you to wait for the gift my Father has promised. And those 120 people were faithful to just wait for 10 days. And then it happened. The baby was born. The Holy Spirit descended and they were all filled. And they were all baptized in the Holy Spirit. And they, they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. That was the birth of the church. Now, the other reason that that's, it's important for us to understand that the church was born is that the Bible describes the local church 
in these terms, that the local church is the body of Christ. It's the body of Christ. When babies are born, we see the body. The body is right there. And when the church was born, a, a, a gathering of people were filled. And that was the beginning of the very first church. And then it began to multiply and grow with more babies being born into the kingdom of God and filled with the Holy Spirit. And, and through a set of circumstances, the church dispersed out of Jerusalem because of persecution only to plant more churches in all of the areas of the known region at that time. And thank God, church planting came all the way to the United States of America and came to Minnesota. And I don't know the date when this church was planted, when this church became an Assemblies of God church, but in the, in the, in the winds of spiritual Holy Ghost revival, many, many of our Assemblies of God churches were birthed in these last hundred years. And you're still existing. See, the church is called the body of Christ, and it means that we have multiple parts as a body. I mean, we're, we're meant to be functional. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, 27, and he says of us as a local church, you are the body of Christ, and each of you is a part of it. Now, when we say that the local church is the body of Christ... The of Christ is very important. The body of Christ, it belongs to God. The church doesn't belong to you. It doesn't belong to Pastor Andrew. It doesn't belong to the district. It ultimately belongs to God himself. Jesus is the head and every appendage, every bodily organ, the skin, the skeleton functions on the impulses that come from heaven, from Jesus, who's the brain. And every body part, just like your body, your arm, your legs, your body functions on impulses that come from your brain. And we function as a church to the best of our ability that we function in the local church to the best of our ability to function in terms of what God is telling us to do. And this is how the local church operates, by the impulses of the Holy Spirit who bring to us and the awareness of what God's will is. Listen, folks, the church is not a spiritual version of Rotary Club. The local church is not a spiritual version of the Lions Club. The church is not a spiritual version of the Boys and Girls Club. Those are great organizations. But those are man's organizations. The local church is God's organization. He, he conceived it. He birthed it. He brings it about. And he guides it through his will, through the Holy Spirit, through the leading of the Lord, through pastors and deacons and church members. So in this sense, the local church is a house in which believers do life. We do the Christian life together. Let's go to the second thing that makes the church so important, and that is the church is unified. It's unified. There's nothing more powerful than a power source that's unified. I mean, think of it. Light, simple light from a light bulb or a flashlight that's displaced, kind of spreads out. That's a, that's a wonderful thing. How many of you got one of these gizmos right here? You got one of these gizmos? I think the thing, I, I get on the internet with this, I send texts, emails, I write notes, I do all kinds of things. You want to know what I use this mostly for? Well, I use it for this flashlight that isn't working. <laughs> My illustration didn't work. Light displaced is nice. Brings comfort, brings direction, brings illumination. That's nice. But do you know what you can do with light that is focused? See, light that is focused, intensely focused, is what we call a laser. And it can cut through steel. And that's an illustration of the power of the Holy Spirit that flows through a unified body of believers unified can we agree together can we like from this day 
March 26, 2023, the day that we are celebrating the birth of the church 2,000 years ago, but also kind of the rebirth of an autonomous general council church. Can we agree as members and attenders that we are going to be focused on being unified under Jesus Christ? That we are not going to get distracted with the drama and the argumentation of men's and women's opinions on things that maybe are good, but they're not ultimate. What's ultimate is to win this community to Jesus. The last thing you want is people to come in here dying in their sin and come into a church that they just begin to feel automatically the people are at odds with each other. Or they're at odds with their pastor. Let me tell you, people read disunity in 30 seconds of coming into a church. And in those same 30 seconds, they can, they can, they can know that they've come into a place where there's unity, there's love. There's a sense of camaraderie, brotherhood, sisterhood. Like this is a family. And with the disintegration of the nuclear family, the dysfunction of our families, people that are hurting come into churches because they have nowhere else to go. And if you'll love each other, the world will know that you are the disciples of Jesus and people will be drawn to that. Ephesians 1.19 says, And His incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength He exerted when He raised Christ from the dead and seated Him at the right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, Every name that is invoked, not only in this present age, but also in the age to come. And God placed all things under His, Jesus' feet, and appointed Jesus to be head over everything for the church, which is His body, the fullness of Him who fills everything in every way. When we talk about the fact that the church was born, that was my first point, we do so because the Bible calls the church the body of Christ, when we talk about the church unified, we do so because the Bible describes the local church not just as a body of Christ, but describes the church as a family of God. A family of God. And what is a family that's not unified? Let me tell you what that family is. It's the Kardashians. <laughs> And I'm sorry to say that some of our churches are like the Kardashians. But that isn't going to happen here. Amen? Amen. We're going to watch in which the way the devil wants to plant drama. And things that we have opinions on that aren't the major things. They're not the most important things. To learn how to disagree agreeably. To learn how to do that. Because every family has to do that. Not everybody agrees upon everything in the family. But moms and dads have set a culture, have set a tone, have set an atmosphere, have set boundaries, have set rules on how we're going to get along. Our kids were always fighting with each other. Oh, they were always fighting with each other. And we kept planting the vision in their hearts as they were at each other's throats. We navigated and we negotiated and we refereed them. And we are always saying to those kids, listen, you need to learn to get along because when you get to be adults, you're going to be best friends. And it's a beautiful thing because our four kids are like best friends. And it's a, it's a beautiful thing. Your best friends should be people who love Jesus like you love Jesus. Now, you should have some really good friends who are sinners. Please do. Be salt and light. But the people that you go deepest in life should be those whose God is the same God as yours. And make sure as you do life together, when you do have those disagreements and those things that you have to work through, do it in the, with the love of the Lord because this is the family of God. Let's go to number three. The church is born. The church is unified. Number three, the church is led. The church is led. When we say that the church is led, it's referring to another insightful description of the local church when, the, when 
when the Bible, when Jesus infers that a gatherings of people like you and I in settings like this on a street corner along a highway, Jesus refers to us, describes us like a flock of sheep. We are like a flock of sheep. You know that the title pastor is the Greek word for shepherd. Because when Jesus was alive and back in Bible days, one of the, one of the, one of the premier, one of the most common ways of, 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 of earning a living was to work the land either with agriculture or work the land with animals like sheep. And so there were all kinds of people that were shepherding sheep. And the way in which the way in which David took care of the sheep as a shepherd boy, the way he was diligent, the way he was faithful, the way he understood what his role was, and he did it in such a great way, God said, that young man has everything that I need for someone to pastor the nation of Israel as a king who will pastor them, not just rule them. With skillful hands, and integrity of heart, the psalmist describes David. With skillful hands, integrity of heart, the way he did it with sheep, I'm going to raise up David with skillful hands and a shepherd's heart to lead the nation of Israel. So you are a flock. You are like sheep. Which means, forgive me. You need, you need leadership because you're dumb. Sheep, sheep are very simple animals. You don't see very many sheep trick shows. Because they're dumb. And I don't mean to insult you. But God said we are sheep. We are like sheep and we need a shepherd. And our great shepherd is Jesus. But, but Jesus has appointed an under-shepherd who works for him. And his name is Pastor Andrew Shaw. He's your shepherd. Yeah, hallelujah. Way to be affirmed. And just so you know, your pastor, who is your shepherd, also has a shepherd. Yes, it's Jesus, but he has, he has human shepherds who keep watch over him, and I'm one of those shepherds as an executive officer. Amen. And our superintendent, Mark Dean, and our secretary treasurer, Jim Philbeck, we are the shepherds of, our, of the pastors of this district, keeping them accountable, leading them, loving them, correcting them, doing all the things that a good shepherd does to keep his sheep healthy and alive. See, sheep are known as grazers, and they notoriously neglect where they're going. They never lift up their head. And when they, because they don't lift up their head, they drift. And that's human nature. You, you as a human being, even though you love the Lord and you're growing in the Lord, you still have a tendency to drift. And the church is here, and the ministries of the church are here, and the messages of your pastor are here to get you to look up because you're drifting in your attitude or choice of behavior or this or that and this church is not going to get legalistic in any way shape or form but it's going to preach the bible which sometimes has to bring a warning to us to keep us from drifting so far from the flock that we become an easy target for an animal of prey and that's exactly what the devil's looking for sheep that are drifting not really being in church that often do you know that the average amount of time that people are attending church these days is like one time a month. Now I know that we have activities and things are happening on Sundays where they didn't used to happen on Sundays, and I get that. But if we use that as an excuse to be here once in a while, we are drifting. We are drifting, and our attitude shows it, and our carnality emerges, and our temptations get the best of us, and we need this every week experience. And if you can't, absolutely can't get here, the camera's are on. I'm just looking at the camera. People that aren't here can be watching online. You can stream it. But that's not a substitute for being here live. 
Because I'm telling you what, this worship team, oh, man. I'm a good old Montana boy, raised in Montana. That was Montana bluegrass up here. That, was, that just brought me back. But it was the presence of God anointing those musicians and singers, and you can't replicate that when you're just at home. Use the live stream when you're sick and you're traveling, but be here. Be here so that, I think someone said, can iron can sharpen iron. You can be sharpened by being with your friends and fellow believers and being with your pastor and you won't drift. Sheep are also notorious for destroying grassy meadows, not only eating the grass, but just digging all the way to the root system and just destroying a field. And so shepherds have to rotate the flocks to different meadows and that's what God's going to do, as he's been doing through Pastor Andrew and Mary. They're leading you, not, li you know, not literally, but they're leading you from, from place to place in terms of vision, in terms of programs, in terms of uh, uh, things that need to be accomplished to reach this community. And it's a powerful, powerful thing to be led. Probably the most well-known fact about sheep is that they are completely useless in defending themselves. God created these innocent little animals called sheep. And virtually every animal that God created, he gave them either a hard shell or sharp teeth or fangs or, or sharp, you know, they, some mechanism to protect themselves. But sheep have nothing. <laughs> they got nothing. In fact, they are so defenseless. Have you ever seen a sheep fall asleep? and go upside down on its back. They, they fill their belly, they fill their belly, they fill their belly, and then the, in their belly, the, the food they're eating starts to digest and starts to ferment and it starts to bloat their little belly and they fall over and they roll on their back and they can't get back on their feet and they'll die if they don't have a shepherd who comes to turn them over. And if they're not turned over, they die, they, 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 they suffocate. Or that animal of prey just says, ooh, easy dinner right there. What's my point? You need to be led by the Holy Spirit, by the Word of God, by a pastor who's committed to the Holy Spirit, committed to the Word of God. David wrote, the Lord is my shepherd. I got almost everything I need. <laughs> ah, wrong answer. The Lord is my shepherd. I have everything I need. I lack, I, 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 I want nothing. That's what happens when you let the Holy Spirit lead you, when you let Jesus be the great shepherd, when you stay close to the local shepherds God, give, God has given you. You're reminded, you're reminded, Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, even when the offering plate, the offering opportunity is given, you know you got bills that are unpaid. You know you got some things that you're afraid of, you got to fix, and you don't have, can't afford this or that. And yet you know God will take care of you. And you re remember, you remember, you remember, your pastor reminds you that 90% of your income will go further than 100% of your income because you, you know that when I return the tithe to the Lord, God blesses the rest and it just makes it go further. But if I hold on to every part of it and I don't return to God what's His, it's like it, it, I, got, I got pockets with holes in them. The Lord is my shepherd. I've got everything that I need. Let's go to the last point, and that is this. The church is born, the church is unified, the church is led, and finally, and really, most excitingly, the church is fueled. The local church cannot function to its fullest potential merely on the strength, wisdom, finances that human beings bring to the table. Now, we need to bring all of that to the table and say, Lord, it's all yours. Use my brain, use my talents, use my skill, use my wallet, use all the stuff I've got in my garage. And, and how about, because you've got so much stuff, you've even, you've even got a rental unit where you've stored stuff. How about we let God have access to that stuff too? How about letting God have access to your kids? 
Churches like this, who have a heart for souls locally and who have a heart for the souls of people around the world, that have a heart for missions, are going to see the children in that church called to be pastors, youth pastors, children's pastors. You're going to have children called to be missionaries. And the last thing that should happen is mom and dad not letting their kids go into the ministry or go to the mission field. They're not yours. They came through you, but they're God's. You dedicate your children when they're babies. And you're saying, God, they're not our kids. Thank you for letting us, thank you for loaning us these beautiful kids for 18 years. But, but they're yours. They're yours. See, we can't do it in our own human wisdom. We need something supernatural. So here it is, Acts 1.8. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you to be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You will receive power. The Greek word for power is dunamis. And don't think dynamite, because that's not the description of Holy Spirit power. Dynamite is powerful, but it's destructive. And some people come into local churches like this, and they're more destructive with the power of their gifts. And they bulldoze their way, and that's an inappropriate inter interpretation of dunamis power. Besides, dynamite hadn't been invented when the writer used the word. So to say that the word means dynamite is a total misinterpretation. Dunamis simply means supernatural power. Think more like dynamic. The dynamic power of God is supernatural. And when you as believers experience the baptism in the Holy Spirit, and you experience and receive and step out in faith, praying in your prayer language for the very first time that feels weird and awkward and gibberish and childish. Let me just tell you, you are on the road to power. I got little grandchildren. I can't understand a word they're saying. It's just gibberish. Mom and dad know exactly what they're trying to say. See, when you, when you pray in your prayer language, it may sound like nobody understands and you don't understand. The Holy Spirit understands. He's enabling you to pray from the very depth of your heart, your soul, your spirit, the deepest parts of your pain and your joy get expressed through this prayer language and ushers in a new type of power that comes through that more intimate connection to Jesus. It's so wonderful. And when that power hits people and it begins to hit more people and it spreads into a local church... That church becomes powerful. It's fueled by something more than just your money, more than just your intellect, more than just your abilities. Those things are all a part of this program, but they're certainly not sufficient if we're going to reach as many people as possible. I'd also bring to your attention that this whole idea of you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, there's a purpose for it. To be my witnesses. To be my witnesses. Peter says that God wishes that none perish. So I want you to think for a moment as I bring the message to a close. Who's the person in your life, in your neighborhood, that you work with, that's in your family, that lives in the, beyond your alley? Who's the person that is so far from God that you can't even see how they could find God. That's the person that God still longs to be saved. You don't have to figure out how to get them saved. You just need to pray for them and say, Holy Spirit, if you open a window of opportunity for me to engage in a conversation, I don't know what I'm going to say to them. But here's what you know you can do. You can be friendly. You can be kind. You can be inquisitive to anything that they're dealing with or going through. And you know what? You find that and you, all you have to say is, hey, I just, I want you to know I'm going to be praying for you. Jesus changed my life X number of years ago, did a miracle in my life, and I've never been the same, and he can do the same for you in your situation, and I'm going to be praying for you. And you just see where the conversation goes from there. And it might stop. 
And then the next day or the next week or the next month or six months from now or five years from now, that person will come back to you when they're ready. And they'll remember that you were a praying person. And it might be at that point in time that you bring them to church and bring them to Jesus. I close with this story. It's called Life Saving Station. On a dangerous seacoast where shipwrecks often occurred, there was once a crude little life-saving station. The building was no more than a hut, and there was only one boat. But the few devoted members kept constant watch over the sea. With no thought for themselves, they went out day and night tirelessly searching for the lost. Some of those who were saved and various others in the surrounding area wanted to be associated with the life-saving station, so they gave their time, their money, and their effort to support the important work. New boats were bought, new crews were trained, and the life-saving station grew. Some of the new members of the life-saving station, though, were unhappy that the building was so crude and poorly equipped. They felt that a more comfortable place should be provided, so they replaced the emergency cots with beds and put better furniture in the enlarged building. The result is that the life-saving station became a popular gathering place for its members, and they began using it like a clubhouse. The life-saving motif still prevailed in the club's decor, and there was a token lifeboat in the large meeting room, but though their membership numbers were growing, fewer and fewer were interested in going on life-saving missions. About this time, a large ship was wrecked off the coast and they hired crews to get the people that were drowning and they brought them in. They were cold, they were wet, they were half drowned, they were disheveled, they were dirty, they were sick. Some of them were foreigners. The beautiful new club was in chaos. Immediately, the property committee hired someone to build a shower house outside the clubhouse so the victims of shipwrecks could be cleaned up before coming inside. At the next meeting, there was a split in the club membership. Most of the members wanted to stop the club's life-saving activities because they said it was unpleasant and it hindered the normal social life of the club. A small number of members insisted that life-saving was their purpose. And they pointed out that they were still called a life-saving station. But the small minority were voted down and told that if they wanted to save lives, they could begin their own life-saving station down the coast. And they did. But as the years went by, the new life-saving station experienced the same changes. It, too, evolved into a club. History continued to repeat itself, and if you visit that seacoast today, you'll find a number of exclusive clubs along the shore, but not a single life-saving station. Shipwreck, shipwrecks are frequent in those waters, but most of the victims drowned. I want you to bow your head as I pray, and then I'll have Pastor Andrew close the service. <clears throat> I know that you folks here at Living Hope Christian Center do not want your church to just be a social club. I know that. But it's amazing how things can drift. Not so much to the point that a church is no longer a church, but it drifts in that individuals over time begin to use the church merely as its social benefit club. I go to church because my friends go to church. I go to church whenever I'm in a need and they'll give me food and they'll take care of me. I send others to the church whose lives are in upheaval. But I found that I've no longer had my sleeves rolled up to volunteer and to go out in one of those life-saving boats and actually save drowning people. Don't let that drift happen to you. Let this day in which we launch this church into its autonomous functioning, please understand that for you as members especially, and even those that are maybe not yet members, your attenders, that the responsibility of ministry is on your shoulders. 
the responsibility of finances on your shoulders, the responsibility of maintaining this as a life-saving station is on your shoulders, and you're going to do great. Father, I pray that indeed your Holy Spirit would bless these people, this wonderful local church, that you will continue to grant vision and support and excitement into the heart of Pastor Andrew and Mary and the board members and all the members and all the kids and everybody who calls this their church home. Please, Lord, let there be every Sunday people that are cold and wet and disheveled. They may not come from the right side of the tracks. They might not look like us. They might have a different political persuasion. They might speak another language. They might come out of some background of paganism and ungodliness. But Lord, we say this is a life-saving station for all. And Holy Spirit, we trust that you'll save them. And through the hard work of discipleship and family love and reaching out to people, you'll clean them up. You called us to catch them, and Holy Spirit, you said you'd clean them up. Help us not to wait until they're clean. Thank you for your faithfulness, and thank you for the great promise of a great future ahead for this church. I thank you in Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. amen.